The History of a Lie, The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Nathan Lewin The History of a Lie, The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion By Hermann Bernstein Forward this is the history of a lie, of a cruel and terrible lie, invented for the purpose of defaming the entire Jewish people, given out as fiction by a German anti-Semitic writer involved in the Waldeck forgery case, who concealed his identity under the pen name of an Englishman, it was gradually changed and elaborated, and finally groomed as fact. Agents of the Russian secret police department and of the unscrupulous Black Hundreds, then utilized this fiction as the framework for the protocols through which they sought to crush the Jews and prop up the tottering Russian dynasty. Tsarism destroyed itself, but the agents of Tsarism, still dreaming of their past glory and of a restoration of their privileges, are at work again, both here and abroad. Out of the scrap heap of Russian autocracy, they have exhumed their old weapons and are striking at the Jews again. Upon the structure of the old myths they are striving to erect new falsehoods in order to intensify everywhere chaos and confusion and dissatisfaction so that they may attain their own dastardly and selfish ends. In the war's aftermath, the Jews are being blamed by the minions of autocracy and reaction for all the ills that have befallen mankind. Some blame them for the war, and others for the peace. Some attack them for the defeat of the German military machine, and others for the victory of the Allies. In Germany, they are attacked by the Junkers for having opposed the submarine warfare and thus assured Germany's defeat, while in some of the Allied countries, the Jews are denounced for constituting the brains of Germany. All the revolutionary leaders of Germany are credited to the Jews, and Bolshevism, which has as little in common with Judaism as it has with Christianity, is branded as a Jewish movement. And there are Jew-baiters who in their blind madness have gone so far as to declare that ex-Kaiser Wilhelm was not only influenced by the Jews, but is himself of Jewish descent, and for this reason he did not defend Germany as loyally as he should have done. He conspired against the Hohenzollern dynasty and undermined it. He destroyed his own throne because he was serving the secret Jewish world organization. On such absurdities have people been fed, since the armistice, in civilized countries by anti-Semitic agitators and their dupes, while Jews have been slaughtered in the Ukraine, in Poland, and in Hungary. I submit in this little book the documentary evidence showing how the so-called Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion, on which this new crusade is predicated, were forged. Hermann Bernstein, New York, February, 1921 End of Forward Chapter 1 of The History of a Lie, The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion by Hermann Bernstein This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Nathan Lewin Chapter 1 The Mysterious Protocols The Lie of a Jewish World Conspiracy is there a Jewish conspiracy? Anonymous accusations? The mysterious protocols of Sergei Nilus? How did Nilus secure them? Contradictory explanations? Who is Nilus? How his sponsors disagree? And what Russian publicists say? Is there a Jewish conspiracy against the world, or is there a conspiracy against the Jews? What are the so-called protocols of the wise men of Zion? Who is the Russian mystic, Sergeius Nilus, the sponsor of the Protocols? What forces are behind the anti-Jewish propaganda that is international in scope and that seeks at this time to spread all over the world the poison of prejudice and hatred against the Jews, reviving long-exploded medieval legends? Many Americans have asked these questions ever since the publication of The Cause of the World Unrest, The Protocols and World Revolution, The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion, and the anti-Jewish articles in Henry Ford's Dearborn Independent. In 1919, a translation of extracts from what purports to be a book by one Sergeius Nilus was published in Germany. 
During 1920, a translation was published in England under the name of The Jewish Peril, and under various titles, in different versions, it was reproduced in the United States, France, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and even Japan. The Japanese edition is in the Russian language. In all these books, the Russian mystic, Sergeius Nilus, is given as the sponsor of a number of secret documents by which it is intended to show that the Jews are responsible for all the ills that have already befallen the world and that are still to come. The method is simple. Was there a revolution in Russia? Blame the Jews. Was there a revolution in Germany? Blame the Jews. Who made the French Revolution? The Jews. Who caused the World War? The Jews. Who profited by the war? The Jews. Is there anywhere an industrial crisis? The Jews are, of course, the cause of it. Has the world war brought forth Bolshevism? The Jews are naturally the fathers of it. First the Jews engineered the war, and then they pulled the strings behind the scenes of the peace conference. They secured special privileges at the peace table because, according to the protocols, they control the gold of the world, the press of the world, the rulers of the world. And if, as a result of the World War, millions of Jews have suffered untold agonies, persecution, starvation, and pogroms, it is no doubt only part of their deep-laid plot to gain control of the world for Zion through poverty and suffering. Are governments just to the Jews, giving them equal rights? Then it is obvious that Jews are either at the head of such governments or are hidden behind the present rulers. If the Jews cannot exert sufficient influence over the rulers themselves, there are Jewesses in high places through whom the cause of Zion is served. And all this is done by the Jews with but one aim in view, to dominate the world, to become its autocratic masters, to break down the moral power of Christendom and set up Israel as the despot over the peoples of the earth. According to the protocols, all this is engineered with the aid and through the instrumentality of the Freemasons. The propagandists everywhere, in Germany, England, France, the Scandinavian countries, Japan and the United States, basing all their arguments on the protocols vouched for by the Russian mystic Sergeus Nilus, see in the present chaotic conditions the absolute fulfillment of the prophecies outlined by the so-called wise men of Zion years ago. The propagandists are violent and vicious, foaming at their mouths, appealing to the basest passions, insinuating, accusing, pointing their fingers at the source of all evil, at the Jews who constitute but a fraction of 1% of the world's population, and who are in Europe today, after the close of the World War, more wretched and miserable than ever before, persecuted, hounded, and starved. What are these mysterious protocols? How did they come to the Russian mystic who revealed them in 1905 and which have now been exhumed from obscurity for the purpose of enlightening the world and which point to the Jews as the cause of all unrest, chaos, and confusion? Nilus, the Russian mystic, is credited with several versions of how he had secured the protocols and his stories flatly contradict one another. In 1905, he said that the protocols were given to him by a prominent Russian conservative whose name he did not mention and who in turn had received them from an unnamed woman who had stolen them from one of the most influential leaders of Freemasonry at the close of a secret meeting of the initiated in France. Then, several years later, Nilus wrote that his friend himself had stolen the protocols from the headquarters of the Society of Zion in France. Several years afterward, in the new edition of his book, Nilus said that the protocols came from Switzerland and not from France. This time he named his Russian conservative friend, Suchotin, who had died in the meantime. He added that the protocols were not Jewish Masonic, but Zionist documents secretly read at the Zionist Congress in Basel in 1897. Then followed a new edition of the Nilus book, bearing the date 1917. A translation of this edition has recently appeared in this country, containing a brand new explanation as to how the protocols were rescued and given to the world. This explanation is taken from the German version published in Charlottenburg, the introduction to that edition says that the protocols, having been read from day to day at the Basel Congress, were sent as read to Frankfurt on the main. The disclosure of them came through the infidelity of the messenger. The 1917 edition is published with a prologue and an epilogue, like a drama, which indeed it is, with all the ingredients of melodrama. A villain, a mysterious woman, a grand duke, a conspiracy to destroy the world, and a saint. Nilus, who convicts himself in his own writings of falsification in the giving of those various accounts of how the protocols came into his possession. Nothing is known of Sergeius Nilus. 
Russian standard reference books and encyclopedias contain no mention of his name. The anonymous American editor of the Nilus book gives the following information about Nilus. Sergei Nilus, in the 1905 edition of whose book was first published as Zionist Protocols, was, as he states, born in the year of 1862 of Russian parents holding liberal opinions. His family was fairly well known in Moscow, for its members were educated people who were firm in their alliance to the Tsar and the Greek Church. On one side, he is said to have been connected by marriage with the nobility of the Baltic provinces. Nilus himself was graduated from the University of Moscow and early entered the civil service, obtaining a small appointment in the law courts. Later, he received a post under the procurator of a provincial court in the Caucasus. Finally, tiring of the law, he went to the government of Orel, where he was a landowner and a noble. His spiritual life had been tumultuous and full of trouble, and finally he entered a troitsky sergevsky monastery near Moscow. In answer to his appeal for pardon, Saint Sergei, stern and angry, appeared to him twice in a vision. He left the monastery a converted man. From 1905 until the present, little is known of his activities. Articles are said to have appeared from time to time in the Russian press from his pen. A returning traveler from Siberia in August 1919 was positive in his statement that Nilus was in Irkutsk in June of that year. Whether his final fate was that of Admiral Kolchak is not known. The American editor of Sergeius Nilus's book containing the protocols is hiding behind anonymity. The name of the traveler from Siberia, who was so positive in his statement that Nilus was in Irkutsk, is also concealed. And Sergei Nilus, to whom Saint Sergei appeared twice in a vision, is said to have written articles in the Russian press, of which nobody has knowledge. In Germany, Nilus is described as follows. Sergeius Nilus was an employee of the Russian secret police department, of the Ochrana, connected with the church, especially relating to foreign religions. He lived for some time at the Uptina Pustina Monastery. In 1901, he published a book entitled The Great in the Small and the Antichrist. According to the Luch Sveta, Nilus claimed to have received in 1901 a copy of the text of the Protocols from secret archives of the main Zionist organization in France, but he published the Protocols only in 1905. A second edition appeared in 1911, and finally another edition was brought out in the beginning of 1917 but all copies are said to have been destroyed. The Cause of the World Unrest, an anonymous book published in England and reprinted in this country, speaks of Nilus and the Protocols as follows. In the year 1903, a Russian, Sergei Nilus, published a book entitled The Great in Little. The second edition, which was published at Sarskoye Selo in 1905, had an additional chapter, the twelfth, under the heading Antichrist as a Near Political Possibility. This chapter consisted of some 20 pages of introduction, followed by the text of 24 Protocols of Meetings of the Learned Elders of Zion, and the book ends with some 20 pages of commentaries on the Protocols by Nilus. Directly after the Protocols comes a statement by Nilus that they are signed by representatives of Zion of the 33rd degree. These Protocols were secretly extracted or were stolen from a whole volume of Protocols, all this was got by my correspondent out of the secret depositories of the head chancellery of Zion. This chancellery is at present on French territory. In the edition of 1917, Sergei Nilus wrote, My book has already reached the fourth edition, but it is only definitely known to me now and in a manner worthy of belief, and that through Jewish sources that these protocols are nothing other than the strategic plans for the conquest of the world under the heel of Israel and worked out by the leaders of the Jewish people and read by the Prince of Exile, Theodor Herzl, during the First Zionist Congress, summoned by him in August 1897 in Basel. It will be shown later that the so-called Butmi edition of the Protocols, published in 1907, contains a definite statement of the man who claims to have translated them into Russian from the French in 1901, that the elders of Zion mentioned in the Protocols are not to be confounded with the Zionist movement. In the 1917 edition, Sergei Nilus wrote, In 1901 I came into possession of a manuscript, and this comparatively small book was destined to cause a deep change in my entire viewpoint, as can only be caused in the heart of man by divine power. It was comparable with the miracle of making the blind see. May divine acts show on him. 
This manuscript was called The Protocols of the Zionist Men of Wisdom, and it was given to me by the now deceased leader of the Chernigov nobility, who later became vice governor of Stravopol, Alexis Nikolaevich Suchotin. I have already begun to work for my pen for the glory of the Lord, and I was friendly with Suchotin. He was a man of my opinion, that is, extremely conservative, as they are now termed. Suchotin told me that he in turn had obtained the manuscript from a lady who always lived abroad. This lady was a noblewoman from Chernigov. He mentioned her by name, but I have forgotten it. He said that she obtained it in some mysterious way, by theft, I believe. Suchotin also said that one copy of the manuscript was given by this lady to Sipiagin, the minister of the interior, upon her return from abroad, and that Sipiagin was subsequently killed. He said other things of the same mysterious character. But when I first became acquainted with the contents of the manuscript, I was convinced that its terrible, cruel, and straightforward truth is witness of its true origin from the Zionist men of wisdom, and that no other evidence of its origin would be needed. Fyodor Rodichev, one of Russia's most famous liberals, a member of the nobility, a former member of the Duma, writing recently of the Nilus Protocols, and of Suchotin, whom Nilus described as a man of his own opinion, says... For months I hear on all sides about the Nilus book and its success in England, and I am asked, who is Nilus? There was a Nilus, an associate justice of the Moscow District Court. It is said that the manuscript was given to Nilus by Suchotin, the notorious Zemtsvo official of Chelsk. The Berlin edition contains no mention of Suchotin, but in that edition Nilus said, pray for the soul of the boyar Alexis. The name of the notorious Alexei Nikolaevich Suchotin means nothing to the present generation but there was a time when his name attracted attention. Suchotin arrested the peasants of a whole village for refusing to cart manure from his stables because the animals there were infected with glanders. Judge Turikov released the peasants. Turikov was removed for this, while Suchotin justified his act by writing to the Minister of the Interior, Durnovo, that he had arrested the peasants not because they refused to cart his manure, but because they dared disobey him as a Zemso official. The reactionary Chelks nobility made Suchotin marshal of nobility. So it was this man who furnished the protocols of the secret meetings of the representatives of Zion. But how did Suchotin get the protocols? An unknown friend had brought them to him. They were given to him by an unknown lady who had received them from an unknown but energetic participant in the Basel Congress. Is this credible? Well then, there is another version of the origin of the protocols, but that is for the German readers. The Russian government sent a spy to the Basel Congress. He did not go to the Congress himself, but bribed one of the participants. He was carrying the protocols from Basel to Frankfurt to the local Masonic organization. He stopped on the way in a little town and gave the protocols to the spy. He engaged copyists who worked all night and copied the protocols. In the first Russian version, the protocols were supposed to have been brought to Russia in French. According to the German version, the protocols were copied. Consequently, they were in German. But the most important thing is that the protocols are not protocols at all, but a monograph, which could be called the dream of a member of the Black Hundreds. A distinguished Russian publicist says of the sponsor of the protocols as follows. In Russia, the problems of Christianity and Judaism have been studied by such men as Vladimir Solovyov, Professor Troitsky, Professor Kokovtsev, Kartasov, Bulgakov, Berdyaev, men of profound intellect and a living conscience. In them, the counterfeit ravings of the ignorant monk Nilus invoked but a smile of contempt. The low level of the circles in which men like Nilus moved and worked is only too well known. It was the world of police denunciations, divorce perjuries, monastic servility, and feigned blasphemous piety. In order to attract attention, Nilus's protocols of the wise men of Zion had to emigrate from Russia. And the further away they went, the better they fared. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of the History of a Lie – The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of a Lie – The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion – by Herman Bernstein Chapter 2 the story from which the protocols were fabricated. Essence of Protocols was German fiction of Sir John Redcliffe. Who was Redcliffe? His infamous record, 
his blood-curdling story, the meeting in the cemetery, an avowed myth, meeting every hundred years attended by representatives of the twelve tribes of Israel. The son of the accursed also attends and provides comic interludes. The query now naturally arises, what is the origin of these much-heralded protocols, which were published in Russia by Sergius Nihilus in 1905, and a copy of which it is triumphantly announced is now in the British Museum? The anti-Jewish propagandists everywhere content themselves with the history of the origin of the protocols, as given by the Russian mystic Sergius Nihilus. But fortunately, murder will out, and the criminals who perpetrated the stupendous forgery for the purpose of slandering the Jews have left behind clues that enable one to visualize the very process that they pursued in the perpetration of their crime. In 1866-1870, there appeared in Berlin a series of novels entitled Biarritz, Rome, purporting to have been written by Sir John Redcliffe, the pseudonym of Hermann Goetzke, a German novelist with an unsavory past, to conceal his identity and to convey the impression that the anti-Semitism with which his writings abounded emanated from English sources, he selected Sir John Redcliffe as his pen name. According to Meyer's Conversations Lexicon, 6th edition, 1904, volume 8, page 77, Hermann Goetz was born in February 1815 in Trockenburg, Silesia, and died on November 8, 1878, at Vornbrunn. He was employed in the Postal Service, but as he was implicated in the Waldeck forgery case, he left the service in 1849 and devoted himself to literary work under the name of Armin. He published a number of works of fiction, but he was best known under the name of Sir John Redcliffe, having published a series of sensational novels describing the Crimean War, Sebastopol, Rina Sahib, Villa Franca, Puebla, Biarritz, in 1866. A new edition of these works appeared in Berlin in 1903-4. Brokers Conversations Lexicon Supplement Volume 17, 1904, refers to Gotcha, the novelist, known under the name of Sir John Redcliffe, formerly Armin, as having played an infamous role in the Waldeck forgery case. He was compelled to leave the Postal Service and later became a member of the staff of the Prusitze Kreuz Zeitung, the chapter of the Goddard Radcliffe novel which, on even a cursory reading, will be found to contain the very essence of the Nihilist Protocols, was published as a separate booklet in a Russian translation in 1872, avowedly as a work of fiction. I have found a copy of this little volume in the Russian Department of the Library of Congress, Washington, D.C. An examination of this chapter, entitled The Jewish Cemetery in Prague, and the Council of Representatives of the Twelve Tribes of Israel will disclose the fact that every substantive statement contained in the Protocols and elaborated in them is to be found in the Goodish Redcliffe novelette. We are thus supplied with an early draft of the so-called Protocols, which have now been given worldwide publicity by anti-Jewish propagandists and which were first introduced to the world in the form of a clumsy piece of blood-curdling fiction of the dime novel variety. In substantiation of this statement, I now present a translation of this chapter of the Russian version of this novel, found in the Library of Congress in Washington, published in St. Petersburg nearly 50 years ago. Translation Forward the description of the Jewish cemetery in Prague and the legendary story of the meeting of the representatives of the Twelve Tribes of Israel are borrowed from the historical political novel by Sir John Redcliffe to Sedan, published in the magazine edited by Nicholas Stepanovich Lovov. The contents of the legend are not the invention of Radcliffe himself. Rather, Radcliffe, 
with his characteristic fantastic imagination, collected various parts into one whole, and painted all with poetic colors, which strike one perhaps by their excessive gaudiness, but which are nevertheless interesting. Passed by the censor St. Petersburg, May 17, 1872. This product of Radcliffe's fantastic imagination, the work of one experienced in the perpetration of forgeries, will now be permitted to tell its own story. It requires no commentary. It clearly foreshadows the protocols, with all its accompaniment of melodrama, not even omitting the devil himself. The Jewish Cemetery in Prague and the Council of Representatives of the Twelve Tribes of Israel. The Jewish Quarter of Prague represents a remarkable labyrinth of crooked and narrow streets. It is situated in the outskirts of Prague, which witnessed numerous bloody episodes of Bohemian and German history. The dwellers of the dirty and dilapidated houses of this quarter are engaged in petty trading and profiteering in their own as well as in other parts of the city. Prague is the only city in Germany where the Jews live entirely isolated from the nation, whose name they have taken in order to avail themselves of the privileges of the city population and to exploit it for their own purposes. The Jewish quarter in Prague is the same as the rag fair in Vienna and the temple in Paris, and these places deals amounting to thousands are transacted daily. If you take a few steps along this dirty, foul marketplace, you will suddenly come upon an old, high, decayed wall which surrounds a space of from two to three acres. Elder trees and other wild shrubbery wind around this wall. Old Jewish houses are crowded all along near this wall, threatened with destruction at any moment. The strange circle formed by this wall has an unwelcome, puzzling appearance. This is the city of the dead, the renowned Prague Cemetery. In this abode of rest may be seen the spirit of the nation, whose bones found shelter here after long wandering. Here is stamped all its history, full of suffering, struggles, and resistance. It seems as though at any moment these tombs, overgrown with shrubbery, are ready to open. These stones growing for thousands of years are ready to raise themselves, and to let out into the world. The restless wanderer with a pack upon his shoulder, with a staff in his hand, in order to go again to strange peoples, to cheat and combat them and to seek a new Canaan, his dominion. The Jewish cemetery in Prague is the very oldest cemetery known. It was closed by order of the government a hundred years ago. For foreigners, it is a historical landmark. For the Jews, it is a sacred place. The impression of this deserted spot is intensified by its surroundings. Amidst the closely crowded tombs and monuments overgrown with moss, only a narrow passage remains, which is almost entirely covered with shrubbery, a thorn bushes, and mat weed. During the inspection, the watchman will tell the visitor the history of the death of Rabbi Ben Manasseh, the great conqueror of death and Rabbi Lowe, the most learned rabbi of the 17th century. He will speak of Simon the Just and of the Polish princess Anna Schindlerus. He will then lead the visitor to the monument of Anna Cohen, on which can be read the mysterious figure 606, which shows that the Jews, more than 1,200 years ago, had buried their dead here in the legendary times of Lyabush and her daughters. If we are not to believe this figure, we must nevertheless agree with the opinion of the Jews that this is the oldest settlement and the first Jewish community in Europe. Silently, the Jewish guide and the curious foreigner go by one place where under an old lilac bush a heap of stone stands out, and when the foreigner asks, What is this? the guide gives an evasive answer. Beth Chayam, the house of life. This is the cemetery called? Yes, indeed. This place of rest is a house of life, for from here is given the mysterious impulse which makes the exiles masters of the earth and tyrants of nations, the impulse which directs the golden calf to the chosen tribe. 
the Jewish town has assumed a holiday aspect. The stands of the petty retailers have disappeared. Jewish boys and girls were strolling about in their holiday attire. The houses and windows were adorned with green branches. On the old benches sat men, talking seriously. In the alleys, youths were chatting. From time to time, men and women in their best Sabbath clothes were going to the synagogue, carrying prayer books in their hands, while poor Christian women, whom need, had forced to work in this quarter, were running with keys and dishes in order to prepare for the feast. It was the last day of the Feast of Booths, the day of assembly, and dusk was gathering over the narrow streets, with the Christian part of the city was still brilliantly illumined by the last rays of the setting sun. Two men, the older wore a black silk mantle with long earlocks, which showed that he was a Polish Jew. The other was middle-aged, in modern clothes, with diamond studs in his shirt and a heavy golden chain on his vest, walked along the narrow streets without paying any attention to the crowd. The younger seemed to be the guide, having come with his companion to the little house where the watchman of the cemetery lived. He knocked at the closed door, through a crevice of which the bright light of wax candles was seen, showing the watchman's holiday mood. It was a good summer. A large number of foreigners had visited the cemetery and were generous in their gifts. In the doorway appeared the thin face of the watchman, whose short-sighted eyes began to look fixedly into the darkness. Come out into the street, Joel. Somebody wants to talk to you. Oh, God of justice, said the watchman with amazement as he came out of the door. One of the trustees. What is your pleasure to command me? This rabbi desires to make a brief prayer in the cemetery. He is leaving tomorrow morning by train. In the cemetery? This evening? But you know yourself, Mr. Banker, that I am forbidden to open the gates after sunset, and tonight is also the Holy Sabbath. First of all, there is no need for you to shout here about my calling, replied the banker, displeased. Every Jewish rag picker will know that Banker Rosenberg was here to see you. As for the permit to open the gates, I myself, as a trustee, authorize you to do it. I will wait here until he has completed his prayer. The company in your house must not know what we are doing here. Arrange it so that the curious crowd will not rush in there. The watchman disappeared in the house, but soon returned with a bunch of keys, and opened the gates of the cemetery. He took the lantern along and was about to light it. Don't, said the rabbi in a low voice. I don't need any light. Lock the gates from the inside. But, Mr. Von Rosenberg, lock it, I say. The watchman obeyed. Now lead me to the grave of the holy rabbi, Simon ben Yehuda. Hold on to my coat, esteemed sir, said the watchman. It is dark, and you may stumble over the old graves. I can see better at night than in the daytime, my son, answered the learned Polish Jew. Here is the grave. The old rabbi reverently leaned over the tombstone. The watchman heard him pronounce a prayer in Jewish. He used so many words of ancient Hebrew, or some other words of a language he did not understand, that he knew only a few separate expressions although he himself had been in the past a teacher at the Bohemian community. Having completed his prayer, the stranger turned to the watchman of the cemetery. When you accepted the position from your predecessor, did he not give you certain instructions? Me? Yes, you. It was so from the day the first person was buried in this place. Well, and what if he did give such instructions? How does that concern you? This is the first time I am asked about this matter since I am employed here. Because this happens once in a hundred years, and human life rarely lasts as long as that. I see that you know about it, Rabbi, said the frightened watchman. But I can obey you only if you mention the word which was given to me by my predecessor, because I took a sacred oath on the Bible. The Polish Jew bent down and slowly pronounced a word of seven syllables. The watchman bowed respectfully. 
You are the rabbi, he said. All will be done as you command. You will send away the friends who are feasting in your house before the clock strikes eleven. At the first stroke, you will open the gates of the cemetery, and at the last stroke, you will get into your house, lock the doors and windows, lie down in your bed, and turn into a corpse together with the members of your household, into a corpse that sees and hears nothing. I will neither look nor listen. The angel of death will leave your soul and your body and will force you to wander about among the graves to the end of time if you do not carry out my orders correctly. Now go and remember the great virtue of your position. You are the servant of the great Jerusalem synagogue. I need not tell you that you should not say anything to that vain worldly man who brought me here. Both returned to the gates, near which the banker was still on guard. Well, he said, your desire is fulfilled, Rabbi, and you may inform my friend in Warsaw that Rosenberg and Son are always ready to do a favor to a guest recommended by such a personage. Now let us go home. My wife is waiting for us. Let us go, my son, replied the rabbi, but relieve me of worldly pleasures. I shall spend the night in prayer. The banker shrugged his shoulders and gave the watchman a gold coin. Joel, he said in a low voice, the other trustees of the community must not know about this violation of the rule. The watchman nodded, and the companion again disappeared in the dark streets, which had already become deserted, while in the houses people talked merrily, and the sounds of holiday festivities were heard. How poor, dirty, and dark these little houses looked from outside, but it was quite different within. In the rear rooms of many of these houses, the bright light of numerous wax candles was reflected in the splendid high mirrors, in expensive dishes and precious rugs. Girls and women, who in the morning perhaps walked trays in their hands, now were seated at the tables in heavy silk gowns, with golden chains and bracelets, their jewels and diamonds were glittering. The clock in the town hall tower struck ten, in the chapel, near the statue of St. Nevermuncinus. Upon a stone bench sat a large-sized man, with the pale, serious face of Germanic type. Every physiognomist looking at him would have said that this man had devoted his youth to serious scientific work, and that he had spent many sleepless nights over books. The clock had just struck ten, when upon the bridge appeared a man in a light summer coat, of about the same age as the young scientist. His face was pale, of waxen color, without the slightest natural red in his cheeks. His particularly prominent nose indicated his Jewish extraction. His forehead was high and large. His head was strongly developed. He walked straight over to the man who was waiting, and who quickly arose. Good evening. I see you have received my letter. Have you it with you? Yes, I know it by heart. I have read it so many times. My friend, it is written there. I have promised to give you the key to the Kafala, if I ever find the opportunity to do so, although I am not always in the habit of fulfilling my vows. I am ready to fulfill this one if you will wait for me in the evening of October 8th in Prague, on the old Maldo Bridge, under the statue of Nepomuxenus, then follows your name. Yes, that is correct. Have you not yet given up your desire? Less than ever before. You would run to science in a valuable service. Listen, doctor, bend down a little over the rail. That of which we speak must not be heard even by the waves of the Moldau, if we wish to remain alive. The young scientist looked in astonishment at his comrade, but did as he desired. Three years ago, in Rome, when I promised to acquaint you with the mysteries of the Kabbalah, I did it more for the sake of boasting of a power and authority which, in reality, I did not possess. Although I had studied for some time the traditions of my nation, rather out of curiosity than because of the love of knowledge. I knew very well that I could hardly penetrate the corridor of those mysteries which I am still regarding as the sophistry and roguishness of exalted minds, 
invented for the purpose of holding pools and fear and subordination, but several accidental discoveries made by me since then have changed my views and have aroused in me a sense of curiosity. You know, notwithstanding our brief acquaintance, that I am not the type of man who would abandon a clue or a conceived plan. What has caused me to make you my companion in satisfying my curiosity? That does not concern you. It is enough that now we have an opportunity to satisfy our mutual desire, and all depends on whether you will agree to accept the conditions upon which I can make you a partner in my investigation. If these are not against honor and conscience. In this respect, you have nothing to risk. You are rather risking something else, your life. Do you feel that you are capable of facing a serious danger? For the sake of science, yes. Very well. In that case, I must tell you that I will lead you to a place which we will not leave alive. If our presence is discovered, the slightest suspicion that we were uninvited witnesses of the secret will bring upon us persecution which will kill us sooner or later. You are wetting my curiosity, senor. That is all I wanted to tell you. The other thing, you know that I am a Jew by birth, although the Jews have driven me from their midst and cursed me according to their custom and traditions because I adopted Christianity. Still, I have my own reasons for stipulating a condition. Your word of honor that you will be silent about all you will see and hear until I authorize you to speak. I swear by my honor. Very well. You will recall in your investigations of the Kabbalah that in the mysterious books, mention is made of a meeting of the heads or chosen ones of the nation, a meeting which will take place from time to time. Yes, in the Yazir it is said very definitely, and if I understood correctly, such meetings take place every hundred years. Yes, the last meeting took place in 1760, and you recall that shortly afterwards the movement of Judaism started. It is now 1,787 years since the destruction of Jerusalem, and this year is designated for a meeting of the Kabbalistic Sahedrin. This is the day of the meeting. The place is this city. I want to be present at this meeting in spite of the danger and am ready to take you along with me. But will it not be dishonest to listen? Will it not be an unlawful interference with other people's secrets? Per bacco, as we Italians say. With such hesitations, you must abandon once for all the idea of fulfilling your desire. Or do you think that the people who guard the secret of the Kabbalah will bring it to you on a tray? As far as I am concerned, I shall discover the secret at any cost. After reflecting a few minutes, the scientist came to a decision. I shall go with you, come what may. Very well. Now we have agreed. Let us go. There is no time to lose. The tower clock of the town hall struck eleven. At the first stroke, a key clicked in the lock of the cemetery gates, then followed profound silence, which indicated that the cemetery was open. The lights in the Jewish houses were gradually dying out, and at the same time the sounds of the merry feasting also subsided. Mysterious silence reigned in that terrible place. The gates creaked softly. The rustling of long coats was heard, touching the stones and shrubbery. Finally a vague white figure appeared and slipped by like a shadow along the pathways. This figure knelt before one of the tombstones, Three times it touched the stone with his forehead and softly whispered a prayer. Along the path leading from the gates came an old man, bent, limping, sighing, and coughing. He came over to the ancient tombstone and lowered himself on his knees near the white figure that had entered before him, and he too whispered a prayer. Then heavy footsteps were heard, and a tall, impressive figure appeared on the road, clad in a white mantle, and he too fell down on his knees, as though unwillingly in front of the tombstone. Thirteen times this was repeated. Thirteen old men came over to the tombstone. The doctor counted them, but he could not understand whether they were alive or dead. 
A shiver crept down his back. His heart began to beat faster from fright. He involuntarily recalled the terrible legend of the Day of Entonement in the tenth month. Tishri, in the synagogue of Posen, when, during the prayer of Kol Nidrei, the congregation kept growing larger and larger. Unknown people pushing one another, wrapped in prayer shawls, came in, one hundred after another, until the terrified rabbi lifted his hand as if to curse and exclaimed, He who has flesh in his cheeks, let him throw off the prayer shawl. Hundreds remained covered, and when the prayer shawls were torn away from them, all saw the skulls of the dead who had come out of the graves to celebrate the Day of Atonement with the rest of the congregation. As there, it seemed to him that the prayer shawls had fallen off the heads of the praying old men, and a row of dead skulls appeared. At that moment the clock struck twelve. A sharp metallic sound rang out on the grave, after which a blue flame appeared and illumined the thirteen kneeling figures. I greet you, Russia ben Abut, heads of the twelve tribes of Israel, announced a dull voice. We greet you, son of the accursed. A hundred years have already passed. Where have the Nesayim, princes of the tribe, come from? From the lands where the nation of Adonai has been scattered by the orders of your forefathers. Are you ready to fulfill the promise during the coming century? We are ready. Then say, whose representatives are you, and where do you come from? Tribe of Judah? From Amsterdam, replied a strong, loud voice. Tribe of Benjamin? Toledo, came the dull answer. Tribe of Levi? Worms. Tribe of Manasseh? Budapest. Tribe of Gad? Krakow. Tribe of Simon? Rome. Tribe of Zebulun? Paris. Tribe of Dan? Constantinople. Tribe of Asher? London, tribe of Issachar. The answer came in a faint voice and could not be heard distinctly. Tribe of Naphtali, Prague. And I am the representative of the unfortunate and exiles, said the man who asked the questions in a dull voice. I am myself wandering about all over the world in order that I might unite you for the sake of the cause of redemption, which has been promised to the seed of Abraham and which was taken from them by the sons of him who was crucified. Who is here at the house of Aaron? Let him rise, scrutinize the heads of the tribes, and gather the council. The man who was the first to arrive rose, and then seated himself upon the tombstone. One by one the others came over to him, and whispered in his ear a seven-syllabled word, and each time he nodded in approval. After that all returned to their former places, Brethren, said the Levite, our fathers formed a union which compels all those chosen as representatives of the tribes to gather every hundred years at the grave of the great teacher of Kabbalah, whose doctrines give the chosen ones power on earth and supremacy all over the descendants of Ishmael. Eighteen hundred years the struggle has been conducted by the nation of Israel, the supremacy which was promised to Abraham and which was taken away from us by the cross, trampled underfoot by our enemies, under the terror of death and all kinds of humiliation and violence. The nation of Israel, nevertheless, has not abandoned this struggle, and as they are scattered all over the earth, the whole earth must belong to them. Our learned men are conducting this struggle for hundreds of years. The nation is gradually rising from its fall, its power is growing and spreading. To us belongs the earthly God, which was made for us with such sorrow by Aaron in the desert, the golden calf, which the backsliders are worshipping. We hear, they whispered on all sides. When all the gold on earth will be ours, the power will go over to us. Then will be fulfilled the promise made to Abraham. Gold is the ruler of the earth. Gold is power. Reward, pleasure, all that human beings fear and desire. This is the mystery of the Kabbalah, the teachings concerning the spirit which rules the world and about the future. Eighteen centuries we have belonged to our enemies. The future belongs to us. 
for the fifth time in the course of a thousand-year-old struggle to which we have consecrated ourselves. Those who know of the existence of the secret union have gathered here to take counsel as to the means which are afforded us by the sins of our enemies. And each time, for five hundred years, a new Sanhedrin ordered the fiercest struggle. But, excepting Russia, not a single century has been crowned with such success as this one. Therefore, we may think that the time for which we are striving is near, and we may say, the future is ours. Yes, if persecutions against the Jews will not take place in the meantime, pointed out one of the men with a bitter smile. The dark days of such a danger are past. The success of so-called civilization among the Christian nations may serve as the best protection for our endeavors. Before listening to the individual opinions, let us examine the material means, the pure capital possessed by the nation of Israel. But against the three and a half million Jews with their money, there are 265 million enemies in Europe, or rather 500 million fists, remarked one of those present. The head will protect us against the fists, as in the past. Labor is the slave of speculation, and violence is the slave of wisdom. Who will deny that cunning is the distinctive trait of our nation? Our nation is ostentatious and greedy arrogant and pleasure-loving. When there is light, there is also shadow. It is not in vain that Adonai, our God, gave his chosen people the tenacity of a snake, the cunning of a fox, the look of a falcon, the memory of a dog, the diligence of an ant, and the sociability of a beaver. We were in captivity on the rivers of Babylon and have become powerful. Our temple was destroyed but we have built a thousand new temples. For eighteen hundred years we were slaves. Now we have grown head and shoulders above all of the nations. All the twelve pronounced the concluding words. Brethren, said the Levite, the time has come when, in accordance with the laws of the founder of our union, we must determine ways and means by which the Jews shall attain their goal as soon as possible. Our experience of a hundred years will help us in this. He who knows must direct and guide the masses which are blind. We, the builders, will combine the dead stones into a pillar which must reach the sky. The Tower of Babel was destroyed by the hand of him whose name I dare not pronounce, said the skeptic. Our structure rests upon the foundation of promises made to Abraham. It is your turn to speak. Representative of the tribe of Reuben, by what means will the Jewish nation achieve power and supremacy over all other nations on earth? A shrill, unpleasant voice then spoke. All the princes and the lands of Europe are at present in debt. The stock exchange regulates these debts, but such things are done only by movable capital. Therefore, all the movable capital must go over to the hands of the Jews. The foundation for this is already laid, judging from what we have heard here. If we will be supreme in the stock exchange, we will attain the same supremacy in the governments. Therefore, it is necessary to facilitate loans in order to get them into our hands all the more. Wherever possible, we must take in exchange for capital, mortgages on railroads, taxes, mines, regalia, and domains. Furthermore, the stock exchange is a means for the transfer of the belongings of the small people to the hands of the capitalists by drawing them into stock gambling. Transactions and securities are a splendid invention of our nation. Although the stock exchange members cheat one another sometimes, it is the outsider who always pays in the end. The voice which resounded on the Paris boards became silent. Do the Sicanum agree with the opinion of our brother? asked the Levite. A whisper of approbation was the answer to this question. Representative of the tribe of Simon, it is your turn now. A serious dull voice resounded after this order. Each word was pronounced slowly and thoughtfully. Ownership of land is always the ironclad, everlasting possession of every country. This in itself gives power respect and influence. Therefore, 
the Jews should secure the possibility of acquiring real estate. It will not be hard to accomplish this if we acquire movable capital. Therefore, it is necessary to facilitate loans on land. Under the fear of scandal, we will destroy land wealth and minimize its importance. Ownership of land should be mobilized if lands are sold as other commodities. The more we help in the breaking up of estates, the more easily will they fall into our hands. Under the pretext of relieving the poor classes, it is necessary to levy all taxes of states and communities on the land owners. When the land is in our hands, the labor of the Christian workers and farmers will give us a tenfold income. He who did not belong to any tribe laughed sneeringly. This advice is good, but not new. Ask in Paris and in Vienna, who owns the houses there? A whisper of approbation was heard again. Tribe of Judah, your turn. The voice that resounded was marked with conviction and reminded one of the sound of the thaler. Industry, the power of the burger, which hinders the Jewish nation, must be paralyzed even as agriculture. The manufacturer should be no better than an ordinary worker. The means to accomplish this may be the unlimited freedom of trade. The manufacturer will take the place of the artisan as he does not have to work, only to speculate. The children of Israel can adapt themselves to all branches of work. Their capital and dexterity will be the substitute for right. Transforming the artisans into our factory workers, we will be in a position to direct the masses for our political purposes. Whoever resists this system will be destroyed by competition. The senseless and ungrateful masses will not support the artisans in this struggle if commodities are reduced in price to a certain extent. A noisy approbation of the new Sanhedrin showed that the soundness of this advice had long been appreciated and even applied in practice. Now it is my turn, said the representative of Levi. I speak in the name of the tribe of Aaron. The natural enemy of the Jews is the Christian church. Therefore, we must try to humiliate it. We must instill into it free thinking, skepticism, and conflicts. Therefore, we will, first of all, start a war on the clergy. We will try to arouse suspicion against it and ridicule it. The main pillar of the church is the school. Therefore, we must gain influence over the young. Under the guise of progress and the equal rights of all religions, we will destroy the study of religion in Christian schools. And the Jews may become teachers in all schools. Then religion will be taught at home. And as there is little time left for that, the spirit of religion will gradually decline, and eventually it will be destroyed altogether. Agitation for the appropriation of property belonging to the churches and schools the transfer of church property to the state, or, what is the same, into the hands of the Jews will be our reward. Again, approbation followed the words of the man who had spoken. Nobody contradicted him, and he announced, Representative of the tribe of Ishakar, it is your turn. Now an old, trembling voice spoke. Let our brethren strive for the abolition of armed force. The course military art is not for the sons of Israel. Not everyone can be a Gideon. The army is for the defense of the throne and the school of narrow patriotism. Not the sword, but reason and money must rule. Therefore, at every opportune instance, it is necessary to help the downfall of the military class, to arouse suspicion in the masses against it, and to incite animosity against one another. It is enough of the soldiers to do police duty and to protect the wealthy from those who have nothing. The Lion of Judah has spoken, said the stranger angrily. David conquered Goliath. The nations will soon wear long coats and still the military armor. A slap on the horse will be equivalent to a lost battle. It looked as though a storm was rising against this arrogant sarcasm, but the word from the elders restored them all to calm. This is the son of Paul. He may say whatever he pleases, but he will do whatever is decided by the council of the tribes. The tribe of Zebulon may speak. 
a dull voice like a storm in the distance said as follows. Our nation is conservative to its very root and clings fast to what is old, but our interest demands that we participate, or rather, direct the movements of nations. It is indisputable that always is a time of many reforms, whose main purpose is the amelioration of the material condition of the needy classes. But for this, the property classes must sacrifice their capitals. Capital is in the hand of the Jews. Therefore, they must outwardly take part in the movement and try to divert it from social and political reforms. The masses themselves are blind and foolish and permit the shallows to rule over them, who shouts more loudly and more shrewdly than the Jews. Therefore, our nation has been the first on the platform, in the press, and in all Christian communities. The more communities and meetings, the more dissatisfaction and idleness. From this it follows inevitably that the people grow poorer, that they become subjected to those who have money, leading to the enrichment of the latter. Besides, every movement makes us richer, for the smaller people are ruined and are contracting debts. The instability of the foundation increases our power and our influence. Therefore, the support of every kind of dissatisfaction, every revolution, increases our capital and brings us nearer to our goal. This terrible speech was followed by prolonged silence. Every member of the secret Sanhedrin seemed to be thinking of its terrible meaning. The son of Baal again laughed hoarsely. Are you afraid of blood? It isn't yours. Then one member of the gathering expressed his approval, and all others followed his example. Son of the tribe of Dan, your turn. The answer bore the stamp of a Jew of the lower order. Every business in which there is speculation of profit must be in our hands. That is our natural right. First of all, we must get control of the traffic in liquor, butter, wool, and bread. Then we shall have in our hands agriculture, farming. We can prepare bread everywhere, and if dissatisfaction and want should arise, we can easily throw the blame on the government. Petty wares, which give a great deal of trouble and yield very little profit, we can leave in the hands of the Christians. Let them work hard and suffer, as the chosen people suffered for several centuries. This speech scarcely needed approval. The Levite called on the next one. Tribe of Nathali. The following words rang out shrilly and with assurance. All governmental positions should be open to us. Once this principle is established, the cunning and flattery of the Jewish employees will help them to penetrate even there, and they will have real influence. I am speaking only of the post, which bring honor, power, and preeminence. Positions which require work and knowledge may remain for the Christians. Therefore, the Jews may neglect positions of secondary importance. Justice is very important for us. The law is a great step forward. This occupation is suited to the cunning and skill of our people and gives us influence and power against our natural enemies. Why can't a Jew be minister of education, as he has already been more than once minister of finance? Remember the scaffold of Haman. The fate of Shusha and Leopold said a warning voice. Why does the raven croak about the past which is so distant and almost forgotten? More than one of our people has been a minister in France and is respected by the king himself. Approval was expressed in a tone of satisfied pride. Then the orator continued. Our people must be among the legislators of the government. The laws of the Goyim against the children of Israel must be abolished. We will maintain the laws of our fathers. We need no longer any laws that would protect us. No, we must concern ourselves about laws that will give us privileges. A mild law respecting bankruptcy, promulgated in the interests of humanity, would be a golden mountain in our hands. First of all, we must see to it that the law regarding usury is abolished in all countries under the pretext that money would thereby become cheaper. Money is just such a commodity as others, and the law should give us the right to regulate its price according to our desire. Now is the turn for the tribe of Benjamin. 
What can I add to the counsel of such wise men? The Jews should also make use of honors and should be the head of all organizations that may give him honor without risks. And he should engage in science and the arts, which are more adapted to the character of our people and which we can master more easily. We can become good actors and philosophers because there is room for speculation in these domains. In the arts, our people will look after the reception and will burn incense to ourselves. In science, we will take up medicine and philosophy. These afford opportunities for theories and speculation. A physician penetrates the secrets of families and holds their lives in his hands. Tribe of Asher, your turn. We must demand free marriage between Jews and Christians. Israel will only be the gainer even though there be an admixture of impure blood to a certain degree. Our sons and daughters will marry into renowned and powerful Christian families. We give money and thus have influence. The Christian relationship cannot have a bad influence on us, while we can exert a strong influence over them. That is one thing. Another thing is that we respect the Jewish woman, and we enjoy the forbidden pleasure with the women of our enemies. We have money, and for money we can get everything. A Jew must never make a daughter of his own race his mistress. If he should desire to sin against the seventh commandment, he should content himself with Christian girls. What is the use of employing the beautiful girls of the Goyim in our stories, if not for this? Angrily interposed the representative of the evil spirit. Whoever will not want to satisfy our desire will get no work. Consequently, no bread. Go to the large cities and you will see that they are not waiting for your wise men's orders. Substitute a contract for sacrament, and the marriage of Christians and their wives and daughters will come to you still more readily. The terrible cynicism of these words, touching such a delicate subject, must have produced a profound impression, especially since the views of the ancient doctrines were so strict on the topic of moral purity. What does the law say? asked one of the twelve. For adultery with a woman of our own people, death. For seducing a girl, a fine. If she was not betrothed, if she was betrothed, death. But the law is not so rigorous with regard to one who lives with a slave. Her body belongs to her master. Are the Goyim better than our slaves? This explanation was followed by a whisper of approval. The tribe of Manasseh may speak now. The last of the orators lifted his hand, and during his speech he raised and lowered it, as if desiring thus to make a stronger impression by his words. His voice was hoarse and unpleasant, but he spoke skillfully and with assurance. If gold is the first power in the world, the press is the second. Of what value are all the opinions and advice given here without the aid of the press? We will attain our aim only when the press is in our hands. Our people must direct the daily publications. We are cunning, shrewd, and we possess money which we know how to utilize for our purposes. We need great political newspapers which mold public opinion, criticism, the literature of the streets and the stage. In this way, we will crowd out the Christians step by step and will dictate to the world what it should believe in, what it should respect, and what it should curse. We will repeat the sorrowful cry of Israel and the complaints against the persecutions which are directed against us. Then, even though each individual may be against us, the masses in their stupidity will always be for us. With the press in our hands, we can turn wrong into right dishonesty into honesty. We can shake all foundations and separate families. We can destroy faith in all that our enemies until now have believed. We can ruin credits and arouse passions. We can declare war. We can award fame or disgrace. We can uplift or ruin talent. When Israel shall have gold and press in his hands, we will be able to ask, on what day will it please you to put on Atara, crown, which belongs to us by right, to erect Shis, and extend Shebert, scepter, 
over the nations of the earth. A noisy greeting followed these words in the agitated men, who listened hardly understood for some time what was being said at the meeting. At last the voice of the Levite called upon all to be silent. The rash body of both of the twelve tribes have uttered words of wisdom. These words will be as pillars for the times to come. If the son of him who has not rest will write these words upon his memory and spread the seeds among the nation of Israel in order that it may grow to a mighty tree, they will be the sword with which Israel will strike down his enemies. Our posterity must share among themselves happiness, wealth, and power as a shared misfortune and dangers. They must help one another. Wherever one of them places his foot, he must drag another, his brother, along with him. If one of them is unfortunate, others must help him, if he but lives according to the law of our nation. He who was in prison for ten years may become a rich man to whom princes will bow, if only our people will not forsake him. Where everybody is against us, all will be for us. After forty years of wandering in the desert, the hand of Jehovah brought us to power in the land of Canaan. The same hand will lead us another forty-five times, forty years from our misfortune and miseries, to rule over lands which are forty-five times faster than Canaan. If Israel shall obey the decision here adopted by the Sanhedrin of the Kabbalah, our grandchildren, coming a hundred years hence to the grave of the founder of our union, will announce to him that they have indeed become the princes of the world, and that the promise made to the nation of Israel has been fulfilled. Other nations will become his slaves, renew our oath, sons of the golden calf, and go to all lands of the world. The blue flame flared up brightly upon the grave of the rabbi. Each of the thirteen threw upon the tomb a stone which each carried under his cloak. It seemed to the doctor that on top of the tombstone, in the bluish flame, there appeared a monstrous golden figure of an animal. Then he heard the same metallic sound that he had heard when the light first appeared, then impenetrable darkness covered the cemetery. The white figures again slipped by among the tombstones. The gates creaked softly. The clock in the tower struck two past midnight. The last of the mysterious visitors knocked at the window, and a hoarse voice said, as though the speaker knew that the watchman was not asleep, Close the house of life, watchman of those who are awaiting the resurrection and may your lips be sealed with the seal of Solomon for a hundred years. The scholar still lay motionless. He was afraid to stir. All he had heard had made upon him a dreadful impression. A noise near him indicated that his companion was rising, to concentrate in their hands all the capital of the nations of all lands, to secure possession of all the land, railroads, mines, houses, to be at the head of all organizations, to occupy the highest governmental posts, to paralyze commerce and industry everywhere, to seize the press, to direct legislation, public opinion, and national movements, and all for the purpose of subjugating all nations on earth to their power. No, I shall struggle against the golden calf, and shall smash it to pieces as Moses smashed it in the desert. What we heard is a threat against all society, here is my hand. I will be your comrade in this struggle against the power of gold. The Italian shook his head, but accepted the extended hand. No, he said, I want to act alone. There is a force which, if properly directed, is not weaker than gold. That force is poverty and her companion, labor. I shall call them out and lead them into battle. Proud Israel, beware. I shall put against you the artel. Union and labor. And I, said the scholar, with animation, all that is lofty and noble, science, idealism, faith, I shall lead these against this materialism. His comrade laughed. Your ideals will crumble as clay striking against metal. Only the forces of poverty and hunger can be the fighters that will defeat the golden calf. Our ways part here. You will go one way and I another. My promise is fulfilled, but remember your vow. 
Be silent as to all that you have heard and seen here. This is the weird, fantastic thriller from which sprang the protocols. It is the first stage. According to this story, not only were they present at a secret meeting in the Prague Cemetery, the representatives of the Twelve Tribes of Israel, ten of which totally disappeared nearly twenty-five centuries ago, but also the son of the accursed one, the devil, was there, making side remarks from time to time. His assigned function was that of spreading the decisions of the wise men of Zion among the Jews in order that they conquer the world. Dr. Hermann L. Strack, professor of theology at the University of Berlin, one of the foremost Christian authorities on theological and religious literature, commenting on this Scottish Redcliffe concoction, says that this tale of the ghostly convocation in the Jewish cemetery at Prague discloses no real knowledge of Judaism, that the reference to mixed marriages indicates gross ignorance of actual Jewish thought, and that the Hebrew words supposed to have been employed by the spokesman for the various tribes appear to have been borrowed from a dictionary. He also points to Cottage's Redcliffe's story and the rabbi's speech about to be mentioned as the sources of the protocols. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of the History of a Lie The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The History of a Lie the Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion by Herman Bernstein Chapter 3 Fiction Forged into Fact The lie in its second stage. The tale becomes fact. The rabbi's speech. Its authenticity vouched for by Redcliffe. An illuminating footnote. A dedication to the Russian Black Hundreds. The imaginary speech bears witness to authenticity of protocols, themselves based on speech. Three stages of the lie. A number of years after this Russian translation of the Kotska Redcliffe story appeared, Sir John Redcliffe, alias Kotska, deeming it important for his purpose of adding fuel to the flame of anti-Semitism that had been lighted in Germany, undertook to convert this work of fiction this offspring of his imagination, into a statement of fact. This led him to adopt the simple device of consolidating into one continuous speech the dialogue contained in his shilling shocker, and putting the speech into the mouth of an imaginary rabbi in such a way as to make it appear to be an address delivered by him to a secret convocation of Jews. And the very man who had invented the speeches set down in his work of fiction twenty years before, now vouched for the authenticity of the obviously fabricated speech, which he attributed to a rabbi who had his birth in the contorted mind of this notorious forger. A translation from the Russian of the apocryphal rabbi's speech, with the introductory notice published in Russia by G. Butmi in 1907, in a book entitled the enemy of the human race, dedicated by the author to the Black Hundreds, will now be laid before the reader. A comparison of it with the scene in the cemetery will at once demonstrate the identity of authorship. Below is facsimile of the title page of this book, a copy of which is in the Russian collection of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. The Rabbi's Speech to the Jewish People Note. Toward the end of the last century, there appeared a book in London by Redcliffe, entitled A Review of Political and Historical Events During the Past Ten Years. This work was translated into French, the French periodical press, without waiting for the complete translation of the book, reproduced certain parts of it because they were of special interest. Thus the French newspapers and magazines published translations, 
from the English of an intensely interesting speech, most edifying for Russia, from the Hebrew, delivered by one of the rabbis, the authenticity of which speech is vouched for by the above-mentioned author. This inimitable gem must, in the eyes of Russians, assume all the more importance since it is brought out by that highly civilized, humane, and practical country, England, which has given protection to the Russian Jews against the unsuccessfully invented persecutions on the part of the Russian government and people. This monstrous document was sent at a time in printed form in the French language to the editorial office of the Odessa newspaper, Nova Risk Telegraph, for those who might want to examine the accuracy of the translation published in number 4996 of that newspaper, dated January 15, 1891, and reprinted in number 21 of the Petersburg newspaper, Zayama, dated January 22, 1904. The speech relates to the time of the Sanhedrin of 1869. End of note. Paragraphs which were indented in parts in italics were omitted in the Butme version, but are given in the French publication Le Peril Judea Maconique. 1. Le Protocol de Sage de Zion by Juin, Paris, 1920. Our fathers ordained the chosen ones in Israel to gather, without fail, once every century, at the grave of our great master Caleb, the sainted Rabbi Simon ben Judah, whose great knowledge is imparted to the elect of each generation to gain the power over the whole world and authority over all the descendants of Israel. It is already eighteen centuries that the war of Israel is being waged with the power which had been promised to Abraham, but which had been snatched away from him by the cross, trampled underfoot, humiliated by his enemies, ceaselessly under threats of death, a persecution of rapine and violence of every sort. Israel has not succumbed, and if he is dispersed over the whole world, it is because the whole world should belong to him. It has been for a few, eighteen centuries now, that our learned men have been fighting against the cross, with courage and persistence which nothing can break. Our people is rising gradually and with each day. Its forces are growing. It is to us that this God of the day belongs, which was erected by Aaron in the wilderness, this golden calf, this universal deity of the epic. When we become, at last, the sole possessors of all the gold to be found on earth, the true power will practically be transferred to our hands, and the promises made to Abraham will be fulfilled. Gold is the greatest power on earth. It is might. Reward, the instrument of every authority. It is all man, both fears and desires. This is the sole mystery, the most profound science of that spirit with the aid of which the entire world is ruled. This is what the future holds in store. Eighteen centuries have belonged to our enemies. This century and the following must belong to us, the people of Israel, and will be ours without fail. Here for the tenth time during thousand years of cruel and incessant struggle with our enemies, have assembled at this cemetery at the grave of the great master Caleb, the sainted rabbi Simon ben Judah, the elect of each of the tribes of the Israelite people, in order to discuss and agree upon the means of making use in the interests of our cause of all the tremendous mistakes and errors which our enemies, the Christians, have not ceased to commit. Every time the new Sanhedrin assembly proclaimed and preached merciless warfare against our enemies. But not once during the past centuries did our forefathers succeed in concentrating in our hands such an enormous quantity of gold, and consequently of power, as the 19th century has given us. We are therefore able, without any senseless illusions, to flatter ourselves with the hope of attaining our goal before long, and we can look forward with assurance into the very eyes of the future. Persecutions and insults, 
these somber and torturous times, which the people of Israel bore with heroic patience, have fortunately come to an end, owing to the progress of civilization among the Christians. And this progress is the best shield under which we can hide and scheme, in order that we may cover quickly and decisively the last leg of that distance which divides us from our supreme aim. Let us cast a cursory glance at the economic situation of Europe and analyze the resources which fell to the Israelites from the beginning of the present century, owing to the concentration in the hands of the tremendous capital which is in their possession at the present time. It turns out that in Paris, London, Vienna, Berlin, Amsterdam, Hamburg, Rome, Naples, etc., and in all lands, the Rothschilds, that everywhere the Israelites are the masters of the financial situation, being as they are possessors of many billions, not to mention localities in the second and third class, where all the financial funds are in their hands, and not mentioning that, without their direct influence, no financial operation, no work of any importance, could be carried out anywhere at any time. At present, all the emperors, kings, and ruling princes are burdened with tremendous debts incurred in order to be able to maintain numerous standing armies, to sustain their tottering thrones. The Bourse quotes and regulates these monies, and we are the full masters of the Bourse in all the centers of the globe. The problem before us now is to facilitate, even to a greater extent, the means of, of contracting these loans and thus to become the sole managers of all valuables, after which the exploitation of all their railroads, mines, forests, large factories, and industrial plants, as well as of all other real property, including duties and taxes, will fall into our hands, as a security for the capital lent by us to the various states." Agriculture will forever remain the principal source of a country's wealth. The possession of large plots of land will pay for us even a broader way to honors and will strengthen our influence over the highest officials of the country. From this follows that our efforts will be directed towards inducing our brethren Israel to make large agricultural purchases. We must, therefore, do our utmost to break up larger states into small parcels in order to be able to purchase them in the easiest and quickest way. Under the pretext of trying to help the working classes, it is necessary to oppress the large landowners with taxation in all its severity, when these possessions will thus gradually be transferred into our hands. The whole labor of the Christian proletariat will become for us a new source of tremendous profits. Since the Christian Church is one of our most dangerous enemies, we must work tirelessly to weaken its influence, and in order to accomplish this, it is necessary to use all our efforts to implant in the Christian intellectual class ideas of atheism, skepticism, dissension, and to call forth religious disputes among the newly formed groups and sects of Christendom. Logically, we must begin by depreciating the ministers of this religion. Let us declare open war on them. Let us provoke suspicions on their devotion, on their private conduct, and by ridicule and persiflage. We shall be right in the consideration attached to the state and the costume of the priest. Every war, every revolution, every political and religious upheaval brings nearer the moment when we shall attain the great end for which we have been striving so long. Commerce and speculation, these branches, most plentiful in their fruits, must never be suffered to slip out of the hands of the Israelites. And once these branches have become identified with us, we shall, through the flattering perspicacity of our executives, know how to penetrate to the prime source of true influence and power. It is understood that we are concerned only with those pursuits that entail honors, power, or privileges, for all those that require knowledge, labor, or disagreeable conditions. These can and should be left to the Christians. The magistrature 
is an institution of prime importance for us. The legal profession develops most the faculty of civilization and imitates one furthest in the affairs of our natural enemies, the Christians, and it is through it that we can subject them to our mercy. Why should not the Jews become ministers of instruction when they have so often been ministers of finance? The Jews must also aspire to the rank of legislators with the object of abrogating the laws made by the Goyim, faithless sinners against the sons of Israel, the true believers, in their invariable attachment to the holy laws of Abraham. Moreover, on this point, our plan is nearing the most complete realization, but progress has nearly everywhere recognized and accorded to us the same civic rights as to Christians, but that which it is of importance to obtain, that which must be the object of our ceaseless efforts, is a law less severe on bankruptcy. We shall make of it a gold mine more rich than will ever the mines of California. With this object in view, the people of Israel must direct its ambition towards those high offices of authority which have the power to distribute honors and esteem. The most assured way of attaining such offices is to have weight and importance in the various industrial enterprises, financial and commercial operations, and to be on guard for all pitfalls and temptations which may lead to the prosecution of the sons of Israel in the country's courts. Our people, in deciding upon one operation or another, must be guided by wisdom and tact, which are the distinguishing traits of its natural gifts. We must not remain passive to anything that may aid us in gaining a place of honor in society. Philosophy, medicine, law, political economy, in other words, all branches of science, art, literature, represent a wide field where even our smallest successes, developing our abilities, will be of great benefit to our cause. These vocations are inseparable from speculation, thus the production of a musical composition, even though it be very mediocre, will furnish to our co-religionists a plausible reason for elevating on a pedestal and surrounding with the hail of the Jew, who will be the author of it. As for the sciences, medicine, and philosophy, they must equally be a part of our intellectual domain. To the physician are usually confided the most intimate secrets of the family, and he, therefore, holds in his hands the health and life of our ancient enemies, the Christians. We are obliged to encourage matrimonial unions between Israelites and Christians, but the people of Israel, risking no loss whatsoever from such contact, will only gain from such unions. The introduction of a certain quantity of impure blood into our God-chosen race will not corrupt it. Our daughters will furnish us with these marriages, alliance with Christian families that possess influence and power. In exchange for the money that we give, it is just that we obtain influence on everything that surrounds us. Our relationship with the Christians will not make us deviate from the path we have always been following. On the contrary, with a certain degree of artfulness and cunning, this relationship will gradually make us full masters of their destinies. It is desirable that the Israelites refrain from keeping concubines of our holy faith and rather select Christian girls for the part. The substitution of the simple formality of a contract before some civil power for the church ceremony is of the greatest importance to us because on this condition Christian women will overflow our camp. If gold is the first power on this earth, then the second power is undoubtedly the press. But of what significance is the latter without the former? Since we cannot realize all the above stated aims without the assistance of the press, it is absolutely necessary that the management of all the newspapers and magazines of all the countries be in our hands. The possession of gold, of the press and of sufficient means for the satisfaction of certain qualities of its soul, will make us masters of public opinion and will subjugate to us the masses. 
following this method on every step of our way with a persistence, which is one of our highest qualities, we will push the questions aside and reduce their influence to zero. We will dictate to the world what it should believe, what it must revere or despise. It is possible that persons will be found who will arise against us, arming themselves. They will hurl insults and curses at us. But the docile, ignorant masses will hearken to us and will take our part. Once we become absolute masters of the press, we will easily be able to refashion the ideas of honor, of virtue, of faithfulness, and to deal the first blow to the family conception which is considered to this day as the most sacred institution, and which must be reduced to a state of decay. We shall then be able to uproot the belief in that which our enemies, the Christians, shall have worshipped until that time, and instead of that, having brought up the army in a spirit of infatuation with the various passions, we shall openly declare war upon everything that the Gentiles are at present revering and worshipping. May all this be understood and noted, and let every child of Israel become imbued with its true principles. Then our might will glow like a gigantic tree, the branches of which will bear fruits, known as riches, pleasure, power. As a compensation for that hideous condition, which for long centuries has been the unique lot of the people of Israel, when one of us makes a step forward, let the next one follow him. If his foot slips, let his co-religionist hasten to support him. If an Israelite is trapped by the court of the country in which he resides, his brethren in faith should use all their efforts to get him out of trouble or to help him otherwise. But on the condition that the Israelite in question acted according to the laws which Israel observes strictly and guards from so many centuries and the precepts of our religion. Our people is conservative, faithful to the religious ceremonies and usages which our ancestors have bequeathed to us. It is very important for us to pretend to be expounders and protagonists of social questions prevalent at the time in the country, especially of those whose aim it is to better the fate of the working man. But in reality, our efforts must gravitate toward procession and rule over the movements of public opinion. The blindness of the masses and the tendency of their leaders to yield to oratory, as empty as it is loud, make them easy prey for us and a double weapon for our popularity and credit. With aid of oratory, our speakers will be able to make people believe our artificial enthusiasm which Christians usually attain through the medium of genuine sentiment. It is necessary to support as much as possible the proletariat and to subjugate it to those in charge of the finances. Acting in this manner, it will be for us to incite the masses whenever we shall need them. We will use them as weapons for upheaval and revolutions and each of these catastrophes will move our cause forward with gigantic strides and will bring us with a quick pace nearer our goal to reign over the entire world, as it was promised by our father Abraham. For the sake of illustration, the following extracts, out of many that might be selected, are taken from the Godshi Redcliffe novel, which were afterwards elaborated and presented as facts. First stage of the lie, the novelette, if we will be supreme in the stock exchange, we will attain the same supremacy in the governments. Therefore, it is necessary to facilitate loans in order to get them into our hands all the more. Wherever possible, we must take in exchange for capital, mortgages on railroads, taxes, mines, regalias, and domains. Page 32. Ownership of land is always the ironclad everlasting possession of every country. This in itself gives power, respect, and influence. Therefore the Jews should secure the possibility of acquiring real estate. Therefore it is necessary to facilitate the loans on land. The more we will help the breaking up of estates, the more easily they will fall into our hands. Page 33 
industry, the power of the burger, which hinders the Jewish nation, must be paralyzed even as agriculture. Page 34. The natural enemy of the Jews is the Christian church. Therefore, we must try to humiliate it. We must instill into it free thinking, skepticism, and conflicts. Therefore, we will first of all start a war on the clergy. We will try to arouse suspicion against it and humiliate it. Let our brethren strive for the abolition of armed force. Not the sword, but reason and money must rule. Page 35 Our nation is conservative to its very root and clings fast to the old. But our interests demand that we participate, or, rather, direct the movements of nations. It is indisputable that ours is a time of many reforms, whose main purpose is the amelioration of the material condition of the needy classes. But for this, the property classes must sacrifice their capital. Capital is in the hands of the Jews. Therefore, they must outwardly take part in the movement and try to divert it from social and political reforms. The masses themselves are blind and foolish and permit the shouters to rule over them. The instability of the foundation increases our power and our influence. Therefore, the support of every kind of revolution increases our capital and brings us nearer to our goal. Pages 36 to 37 Of what value are all the opinions and advice given here? without the aid of the press. We will attain our aim only when the press will be in our hands. Our people must direct the daily publications. We need great political newspapers which will mold public opinion, criticism, the literature, the street, and the stage. In this way, we will crowd out the Christians step by step and will dictate to the world what it should believe in, what it should respect, and what it should curse. We will repeat the sorrowful cry of Israel and the complaints against the persecutions which are directed against us. With the press in our hands, we can turn wrong into right, dishonesty into honesty. We can shake all foundations and separate families. We can destroy faith in all that our enemies believed until now. We can ruin credits and arouse passions. We can declare war. We can give fame or disgrace. We can uplift or ruin talent. Page 43. The following are parallel extracts from the imaginary rabbi's speech, vouched for by the author of the novelette, as fact a number of years later. Second stage of the lie, the rabbi's speech. When we become at last the sole possessors of all the gold to be found on earth, the power will practically be transferred to our hands and the promises made to Abraham will be fulfilled. Gold is the greatest power on earth. It is might, reward, the instrument of every authority. It is all man, both fears and desires. The problem before us now is to facilitate, even to a greater extent, the means of contracting these loans, and thus to become the sole managers of all the valuables, after which the exploitation of all their railroads mines, forests, large factories, and industrial plants, as well as of all other real property, including duties and taxes, will fall into our hands as a security for the capital lent to us by the various states. Agriculture will forever remain the principal source of a country's wealth. The possession of large plots of land will pay for us even a broader way to honors and will strengthen our influence of the highest officials of the country. From this follows that our efforts will be directed towards inducing our brethren in Israel to make large agricultural purchases. We must, therefore, do our utmost to break up large estates into small parcels in order to be able to purchase them in the easiest and quickest way. Under the pretext of trying to help the working classes, it is necessary to oppress the large landowners with taxation in all its severity. When these possessions will thus gradually be transferred in our hands, the whole labor of the Christian proletariat will become for us a new source of tremendous profits. Commerce and speculation, these branches most plentiful in their fruits, 
must never be suffered to slip out of the hands of the Israelites. With this object in view, the people of Israel must direct its ambition towards those high offices of authority which have the power to distribute honors and esteem. Since the Christian church is one of our most dangerous enemies, we must work tirelessly to weaken its influence, and in order to accomplish this, it is necessary to use all our efforts to implant in the Christian intellectual class ideas of atheism, skepticism, dissension, and to call forth religious disputes among the newly formed groups and sects of Christendom. It is very important for us to pretend to be expounders and protagonists of social questions, prevalent at the time in a country, especially of those whose aim it is to better the fate of the working man. But in reality, our efforts must gravitate toward possession and rule over the movements of public opinion. The blindness of the masses and the tendency of their leaders to fall for oratory, as empty as it is loud, will make them easy prey for us and a double weapon for our popularity and credit. With the aid of oratory, our speakers will be able to make people believe our artificial enthusiasm, which Christians usually attain through genuine sentiment. Once we become absolute masters of the press, we will easily be able to refashion the ideas of honor, of virtue, of faithfulness, and to deal the first blow to the family conception which is considered to this day as the most sacred institution, and which must be reduced to a state of decay. We shall then be able to uproot the belief in that which our enemies, the Christians, shall have worshipped until that time, and instead of that, having brought up the army in a spirit of infatuation with the various passions, we shall openly declare war upon everything which the Gentiles are at present revering and worshipping. The following are excerpts from the new version of the Protocols, introduced by Nihilus in 1905, showing the different stages of the forgery. Third stage of the lie, the Protocols. These extracts are taken from the Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion, published by the Beckwith Company, New York, 1920. All the wheels of the government mechanism are driven by the motor which is in our hands, and that motor is gold. Protocol 5. To make it possible for liberty definitely to disintegrate and ruin Gentile society, industry must be placed upon a speculative basis. The result will be that all profits extracted from industry, from the soil, will not remain in their hands but will pass through speculation into our possession. Protocol 4. The aristocracy of the Gentiles as a political force has passed away. But as owners of land, they are harmful to us in that they are independent in their sources of livelihood. Therefore, at all costs, we must deprive them of their land. The best means to attain this is to increase land taxes and mortgage indebtedness. These measures will keep land ownership in a state of unconditional subordination. Protocol 6. See second quotation above. At the same time, it is necessary to encourage trade and industry vigorously, and especially speculation, the function of which is to act as a counterpoise to industry. It is necessary for industry to deplete the land both of laborers and capital, and, through speculation, transfer all the money of the world into our hands, thereby throwing Gentiles into the ranks of the proletariat. Protocol 6. It is for this reason that we must undermine faith, eradicate from the minds of the Gentiles the very principle of God and soul, and replace these conceptions by mathematical calculations and material desires. Protocol 4. We have taken good care long ago to discredit the Gentile clergy, and thereby to destroy their mission, which at present might hamper us considerably. Their influence over people diminishes daily. Protocol 17. It is indispensable for our purposes that, as far as possible, war should bring no territorial advantages. This will shift war to an economic footing and nations will perceive the strength of our superiority 
in the aid we render. Such a condition of affairs will place both sides under the control of our international agents with their million eyes, whose vision is unhampered by any frontiers. Protocol 2. We will represent ourselves as the saviors of the laboring classes who have come to liberate them from this oppression by suggesting that they join our army of socialists, anarchists, communists, to whom we always extend our help under the guise of the fraternal principles of the universal solidarity of our social masonry. Protocol 3. We will adopt for ourselves the liberal side of all parties and all movements, and provide orators who will talk so much that they will tire the people with their speeches until they turn from orators in disgust. Protocol 5. We shall handle the press in the following manner. To end a Protocol 12. End of chapter 3Chapter 4, The History of a Lie, The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of a Lie, The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion by Hermann Bernstein. Chapter 4, The Russian Sponsors of the Forgery. Nihilus on the Protocols. Only the God-anointed Tsar of Russia can save the world. Passages from Nihilus omitted by translators. On Tolstoy. On the Emancipation of Women. On the Sanhedrin and its faithful ally, England. In 1905, the second edition of Serge Nihilus's book appeared, printed on government presses at Tsarkoi, Silo containing a new and elaborated version of the Protocols. The translators of the Nihilus Protocols, published in its 1905 edition, a copy of which is in the British Museum, have deliberately omitted numerous passages from his prologue and epilogue. These passages show clearly the purpose of the volume. Nihilus writes, We may perhaps be reproached, and justly, for the apocryphal character the document presented, but if it were possible to demonstrate its accuracy by documents or through the testimony of trustworthy witnesses, if it were possible to unveil the faces of those who are at the head of the world conspiracy and who hold its bloody strings in their hands, then the very mystery of lawlessness would be infringed upon, and it must remain intact until its incarnation in the sun of destruction. Then he goes on to say that the world is rushing towards its destruction, and that there is only one force that can save it, and that is the God-anointed Tsar of Russia. The omitted portions of the Nihilist book show distinctly that it is a work of propaganda for the Russian autocracy. Nihilist denounced Leo Tolstoy, the emancipation of women, and all movements leading toward progress. The editors of the Protocols in Europe and America, realizing that these passages would disclose to intelligent people the real motive of the Nihilist Protocols, and thus discredit them, have deliberately omitted them in the translations. Here are some of the omitted portions of the notorious Nihilist book, which are his own utterances and do not purport to constitute a part of the Protocols. They are translated from a photographed copy of the volume in the British Museum. We have succeeded in obtaining for our use from a man close to us, now deceased, a manuscript in which are described with unusual precision and clearness the course and progress of the universal fatal mystery aiming to bring the apostate world to an inevitable catastrophe. This manuscript was given to us about four years ago, in 1901, with the assurance that it was an accurate copy, a translation of the original document stolen by a woman from one of the most powerful and sacred directors of Freemasonry, after one of the secret meetings of the initiates in France, the present nest of the Freemason sect. This manuscript, under the general title, Protocols of Meetings of the Wise Men of Zion, 
I now call to the attention of all who wish to see or hear. These protocols, at a first cursory glance, I seem to be what we are accustomed to call truisms. They are more or less commonplaces, although expressed, with a boldness and a hatred, not altogether customary in commonplaces. A proud, deeply rooted ancient, for a long time secretly growing. And what is more frightful than all? A religious rage boils between the lines, bubbling over and escaping from the overfilled vessel of violence and vengeance, already approaching complete triumph. It must be mentioned, by the way, that the title of the manuscript does not fully justify the contents. These are not protocols of a meeting, but rather the report of someone in power, divided into parts which are not even always logically connected. The impression remains that this is a fragment of something much more significant, the beginning of which has been lost. The origin of the manuscript as given by us above furnishes sufficient explanation of this. We may perhaps be reproached unjustly for the apocryphal character of the document presented, but if it were possible to demonstrate its accuracy by documents or through the testimony of trustworthy witnesses, if it were possible to unveil the faces of those who are at the head of the world conspiracy and who hold its bloody strings in their hands, then the very mystery of lawlessness would be infringed upon, and it must remain intact until its incarnation in the sun of destruction, in the complexity of the present criminally earthly process. We must not search for direct evidence. We are forced to content ourselves with indirect proof, and of these it seems that the attention of the sad Christian observer is fully satisfied. The history of the Rothschilds show that the whole Republican era of France is due to Zion, and not a single one of those elected to office has to this time ever done what he promised to do. If the demands of his electors did not coincide with the plans of the government of Zion, what has become of unfortunate France? Let him who has ears listen. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth. Is not this Tolstoy and his followers scattered over the whole world? In every age there have been many women drowning in sin and led on by various lusts. The ebb and flow of this sin in woman's heart characterized whole epics of particular human defection, but at no time of the seeming triumph of sin have there been women constantly studying. This sign represents entirely a universal inheritance and is an exclusive characteristic of our epic who is ignorant of the so-called woman question, the emancipation of woman that has already succeeded in breaking up so many families and which threatens an even greater disruption in the future. For the sake of some phantom, the bride and mother abandons her true mission. Is not this the greatest and most unfortunate world revolution? The Sanhedrin was unseizable and invulnerable. It carried the roots of evil from France into Scotland, where under a different name it entered into a league with United England, with whom, after having let it in behind the curtain of its secret, and having declared deadly war to papism, it cooperates even to the present day, helping out England in her exploits over the whole world, with its capital and concessions in which respect the Sanhedrin was never penurious. As to the question why England, and no other European government, was chosen as the point of resistance for the fighting Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin gives no reply. We are inclined to think that the cause is to be found in the isolated island position of the sufficiently strong government, and perhaps in the kinship between the English and the Jews. Footnote. 
As is known, there is a scientific theory which tries to prove that the English are the descendants of one of the scattered tribes of Israel. The Sanhedrin, which directs the course of contemporary science, is not ashamed to produce whatever theories are advantageous to them. According to certain tenuous evidences in the air, it seems that a new theory is being produced according to which the honor of birth relationship with the God-elected Sanhedrin is extended to America and Japan. Avis a la Gantere. End a footnote. Having covered the whole of Europe with a network of Masonic lies, the symbol of the Temple of Solomon is preserved for them also. Possessing countless millions, in face of the general fall of the Christian spirit among the European peoples, in whom there was artificially spread and supported the cult of the golden calf, having poisoned the idea of godliness and spirituality in the heart of the peoples by scientific theories, the Sanhedrin, the priest of the golden idol created by it, has gained control of the spiritual life of all Europe, and with its help, with the help of its gold, with the sold consciousness of those standing at the helm of power, and with the help of its faithful ally, England, it has corrupted and perverted all the political foundations of Europe, and through them, the well-being and spiritual health of its population. The French Revolution, glorified by the Masonized historical science of greatness and the fall of the great Napoleon, have shown to the world the significance and strength of the Sanhedrin. But the world did not recognize the new manifestation of Satan. At that time, the words of truth of the Evangel and the apostolic foresight had become alien to him. End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of The History of a Lie, The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of a Lie, The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion, by Herman Bernstein. Chapter 5, Forgers Disagree. The Butme Protocols, representatives of Zion, not to be confounded with Zionists. Butme contradicts Nihilus, plan for world conquest conceived 929 BCE. The symbolic snake, universal suffrage, a Jewish device, every Jew familiar with plot. In the book issued by G. Butme, to which reference has been made and which contains the rabbi's speech already considered, there is to be found still another version of the protocols. But me was a black hundred writer. It appeared in 1907 and was dedicated to the black hundred organization. Appropriately enough, it was published by the Society of Deaf and Dumb, as will be seen from the facsimile reproduction of the title page. With exceeding naivete, but me published the forged speech attributed by Redcliffe Burchetts to the Jewish rabbi as proof of the genuineness of the protocols, and side by side with the fabricated speech of his but me version of the protocols, which had undergone further changes subsequent to the publication in 1905 of the documents by Serge Nihilus. The headlines of the protocols in the Butme 1907 version read as follows. Protocols taken out of the secret depositories of the main office of Zion. Extracts from ancient and modern protocols of the sages of Zion are the universal organization of Freemasons. Thus the protocols were in 1907 presented by G. Butme, dedicated to the Black Hundreds as Masonic not as Jewish documents. In his introduction, the author says in part as follows. These secret protocols were secured with great difficulty in fragmentary form and were translated into Russian in December 1901. It is almost impossible to get at the secret depositories again where they are hidden and therefore they cannot be reinforced by definite information as to the place 
day, month, year, where and when they were composed. The reader, who is more or less familiar with the secrets of Freemasonry, will draw from the general character of the criminal plot outlined in the protocols, the conclusion as to their authenticity, and from several details he will suppose with great certainty that the mentioned protocols were taken from the documents of the Masonic Lodge of Egyptian Ritual, or Mizram, which is joined mostly by Jews. But the above-mentioned failure to mention the time and place where the protocols were composed might call forth in the reader, who is entirely unfamiliar with the abominations of Masonic doctrines, doubts as to the authenticity of these documents. At the end of the protocols, published in this edition by Putney in 1907, there appears a note by the man who declares that he had secured and translated the documents from the French on December 9, 1901, and in the very first two lines of his note, he states that the representatives of Zion mentioned in the documents are not to be confounded with the representatives of the Zionist movement. The Russian mystic Serge Nihilus, in his later editions, connected the documents with the Zionist Congress in Basel and with the head of the Zionist movement, Dr. Theodor Herzl. The translator, as do Nihilus and Ludwig Stansky, also gives a version of the political plan devised by the wise men of Zion. This translator, however, states that the political plan was conceived 929 years before the birth of Christ. It was invented by Solomon and Judean sages in theory. Here follows extracts from the so-called translator's note. Translator's Note the expounded protocols assigned the representatives of Zion. Do not confound them with the representative of the Zionist movement. They were taken out of the whole book of protocols, the entire contents of which it was impossible to copy because of the short time allowed the translator for reading these protocols. A small appendix was attached to them and a plan of conquering the world by the Jews by peaceful means. Those protocols and the sketch were taken from the secret depositories of the main office of Zion, now located on French territory. The above-mentioned sketch contained the entire political plan of Zion with regard to the stages to be passed through by this movement and to the means of passing from one to another. The aforesaid political plan was conceived 929 years before the birth of Christ. It was invented by Solomon and the Judean sages in theory. According to historical events, it was elaborated and enlarged by their followers, initiated in this plan. These sages decided to conquer the world peacefully for Zion, with the cunning of the symbolic snake, whose head should be composed of the Jewish government initiated in the plans of the wise men, always masked even to their people, and the body, the Jewish nation. Crawling into the bosom of governments, this snake has undermined or eaten away all non-Jewish governmental powers, according to their growth, in various continents, but particularly in Europe, which we should do also in the future, following exactly the outlines of the plan until the cycle of the road traveled by it will close by the return of the head of the snake to Zion. That is, until this snake will include in the sphere of its circle all Europe, and through Europe the whole world, utilizing all forces conquered by economic means in order to draw the other continents into the sphere of its cycle. For instance, the economic theory of the ballot system has made it possible to carry out everything that was desirable in the interest of the elevation of Zion. The Jewish authorities commenced to act by means of bribing or by instigating the majority of votes as soon as they succeeded to manage so that the decisions of that majority became the determining factor in questions of national life. The crowd always in need, or the greedy intelligent class, short-sighted liberals and other blind people, have also rendered good service to Zion. Therefore, the Republican is the most desirable and convenient form of the government for Zion, 
because it gives full sway to the activities of the armies of Zion, the anarchists of thought and action, called socialists. All that which is outlined above is the work at the hands of the nation without a territory, constituting but a drop in the ocean of humanity, but possessing the most ideal government, every member of which is familiarized with the plan of action worked out in the course of centuries, from which he cannot deviate. The politics of the Goyim is the politics of accidental circumstances, engineered by the Jews, and tends not towards perfecting the affairs of the state, but towards struggle for the sake of greed, or more often for the personal aggrandizement of the administrators. From this it is clear on whose side there must be victory in the guidance of the world. Translation from the French, December 9th, 1901. End of chapter 5. Chapter 6 of the History of a Lie. The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of a Lie. The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion by Herman Bernstein. Chapter 6. The Black Hundreds, Their Dupes and Crimes. Russia in 1905. The Unsuccessful Revolution. The Reaction and the Reactionaries. Lutherstansky and His Work. The symbolic snake, according to Lutherstansky, who plagiarized Lutherstansky on the English people. Are the English the lost tribes? How the protocols were doctored by but me. Conclusion As the writings of Sergius Nihilus are typical of the literature produced under the auspices of the Russian Black Hundred organizations, which sought to save the Tsar's throne by pogroms, I examined a large number of publications brought out in Russia during the period when the Russian mystic, Sergius Nihilus, published his pretended discovery, The Protocols, his book, The Great and the Small and Antichrist, appeared in 1905 after the Russo-Japanese War, when the Russian Revolution has made an attempt to overthrow the Tsar's government. A new organization was formed for the support of the Russian throne. It was known as the Union of the Russian People, the Black Hundred, whose program was Jew-baiting. It was then that Russia adopted a definite anti-Jewish policy of vengeance, a pogrom policy. The Black Hundred held the Jews responsible for Russia's defeat in the war and for the attempted revolution and neither the Tsar nor his loyal organization of the Black Hundred ever forgave Count Sergius Witt, who won for Russia at the Portsmouth Peace Conference what she had lost on the battlefields for inducing Nicholas II to grant a constitution to Russia. The Black Hundreds, nicknamed Witt, the Jewish Count of Portsmouth, they attacked him and attempted to assassinate him. They assassinated at that time two Jewish members of the Duma, Jolis and Herzenstein. It was during that period of Judophobomania that Sergius Nihilus published his book Introducing the Protocols in Russia. In my investigation, I naturally examined the works of the Russian arch-anti-Semite Ippolit Lutersansky, who first accused the Jews of the most despicable crimes, and then, in 1882, after the occurrence of the pogroms in the south of Russia, wrote a volume retracting all his previous anti-Jewish accusations and declaring anti-Semitism to be nothing but an outgrowth of ignorance and malice. Several years later, he resumed his anti-Semitic agitation and became one of the most vicious vilifiers of the Jewish people on the eve of the notorious Pilots Affair which was staged by the Russian government for the purpose of discrediting the Jews and of justifying the Russian governmental anti-Jewish policy before the world. After the collapse of the Bilis prosecution, which involved the absurd charge of ritual murder, Lutostansky 
approached several prominent wealthy Jews with an offer to retract his new charges against the Jews, provided they would pay him a certain amount of money for his book. The Jews declined to have anything to do with the charlatan, who had caused so much harm to the Jews of Russia, by his monstrous accusations. His works attracted special attention because of the fact that they were endorsed and supported by Russian Grand Dukes and by the Dowager Empress of Russia. While examining one of his books entitled The Talmud and the Jews, published in 1907, in which he promised the publication of the Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion in his forthcoming volume, I came upon an amazing passage in his introduction, outlining an alleged secret plan of the Jews to gain world domination, which I find reproduced word for word, with but a few phrases changed, in the epilogue of the Russian mystic, Sergius Nihilus. Did Sergius Nihilus plagiarize Lutistansky? Or was it Lutistansky who plagiarized Nihilus? Or were they one and the same person? At any rate, both served the purposes of the Black Hundreds against the Jews, and both employed the same weapons. Here is a translation of Lutistansky's introduction. From Lutistansky's Introduction, 1907 Explanation of the Zionist Symbolic Snake The political plan represented in the form of a snake is very old and was devised by the Judean sages in theory and in the course of historical developments, it is elaborated and augmented by their initiated followers. These sages decided to conquer the world peacefully for Zion, by the cunning of the symbolic snake. The head of the snake represents the sages of Zion, and the body, the Judean nation. Crawling into the bosoms of governments, this snake undermines, eats away all non-Judean governmental forces, as they grow on various continents, but especially in Europe, which it is to do also in the future, carefully following the outlined plan, until the cycle of the road traveled by it is completed by the return of the head of the snake to Zion, that is, until this snake will include within the sphere of its circle the whole of Europe, and through Europe the whole world. First of all, they are endeavoring to introduce everywhere irreligion and moral decadence, utilizing all forces they have won economically in order to drag the other continents into the sphere of their cycle. As the return of the head of the state could be accomplished only over the raised ruins of the governmental power of all European countries, through the collapse of this power, through economic disorganization and ruin, introduced by Zion everywhere, by means of moral decadence. Corruption is introduced with aid of Jewesses under the guise of French or Italian women, who even undergo fictitious baptism for these purposes, and then become the wives of prominent men, like the biblical Esther, and they are always accompanied by their Mordecais, and make their politics for the good of the Jews. These so-called French and Italian women are the best carriers of immorality from place to place. These women are used for those who, because of them, are always in need of money, and therefore willingly barter their conscience to secure money at any cost. The money is reality only loaned to such conscience barterers, for it quickly comes back to the hands of those loaned the money, as it is squandered with the aid of these women soon after they receive it. The Zionist nets are spread out on all the roads of the Goyim, Gentiles, and the cycle of the snake is moving along in the 20th century with the speed of an express train toward its goal. The complete outline of all the secret protocols of the Zionist Jewish sages, the entire plan of the conquest of the whole world, will be included in the next seventh volume of the Talmud and the Jews. And this is a facsimile reproduction and translation of Sergius Nihilus' epilogue, taken from the copy of the Protocols in the British Museum, from which the American translation was made. From the Nihilus Epilogue, 1917 According to secret Jewish Zionism, a political plan was devised in theory for the peaceful conquest of the world for Zion. 
by Solomon and other sages already 929 years before the birth of Christ. In the course of historical developments, the plan was elaborated and augmented by their followers initiated in this affair. These sages decided to conquer the world peacefully for Zion by the cunning of the symbolic snake, whose head should constitute the government of the Jews, initiated in the plans of the sages, always masked even from their own people, and the body, the Judean nation, penetrating the bosoms of the governments encountered on the way. This snake has undermined and eaten away, overthrowing all governments, non-Jewish forces according to their growth. This it should also do in the future, carefully following the outlined plan, until the cycle of the road traveled by it is completed by the return at the head of the snake to Zion, and until the snake will thus include and concentrate in the sphere of its circle, the whole of Europe, and through Europe the rest of the world, utilizing all forces of conquest and by economic means, in order to subject also the other continents to its influence to the influence of its cycle. The return of the head of the snake could be accomplished only over the raised plains of the governmental power of all the European countries, that is through economic disorganization and ruin, introduced by Zion everywhere by means of spiritual decadence and moral turpitude, chiefly with the aid of Jewish women under the guise of French, Italian, and Spanish women, the best introduces of immorality into the conduct of the rulers of nations. Women in the hands of Zion serve as bait for those who, owing to them, are always in need of money, and therefore barter their conscience in order to get money at any cost. This money, in fact, is only loaned to them, but it quickly comes back to the hands of bribing Zion through these very women, and at the same time, they have secured slaves for Zion. A comparison of these pages shows that Nihilus merely added to Lutherstansky's version, a statement to be found in Buckney's version, that the political plan for the peaceful conquest of the world for Zion was devised in theory by Solomon and other sages, nine out of twenty-nine years before the birth of Christ. Lutherstansky said in 1907, that the head of the snake represents the sages of Zion, and the body, the Judean nation, while Nihilus said that the head should constitute the government of the Jews initiated in the plans of the sages, always masked even from their own people, and the body, the Judean nation. Thus the sages of Zion were transformed by Nihilus into the government of the Jews in order to connect the political plan all the more closely with the protocols. The American editors have omitted this part of the Nihilus epilogue, evidently because it seemed even to them too absurd for American consumption. All of the literature about the protocols that appeared in various parts of the world in 1920 is based on the documents vouched for by the mysterious Sergius Nihilus and fortified by the irresponsible Jew Bader, an intellectual pervert, Ippolit Lutherstansky, that the nihilist Lutherstansky Butma campaign was just what the Tsar's government desired may be seen from the photographic reproduction of the letter sent to Lutherstansky by Grand Duke Michael, who was regarded as the most liberal among the Russian Grand Dukes. The letter appears together with other letters of congratulation from members of the imperial family in the volume containing the passages quoted above. For the benefit of the anti-Semitic agitators in England, such as the editors of the Morning Post, the New Witness, the Spectator, Blackwood's Magazine, and a number of irresponsible publications needless to name, it will prove instructive and interesting to reproduce a few additional passages from the same volume, in order that they may know and appreciate not only what that authority said concerning the Jews, but also what he thought of the English. On pages 279, 282, and 283 of volume 6 of the Talmud and the Jews, after outlining 
the alleged Jewish plot to gain world dominion. Ludostansky wrote in 1907, The English are typical pure-blooded Israelites. In ancient times, they were all red-headed. As we see from the descriptions in the Bible and the New Testament, the characteristic of the Israelites is known to the whole world under the sun. The characteristic of the English, if we follow it closely, does not differ from the Jewish in the slightest degree. Who are the English? This question has long occupied the minds of many people in Europe, as well as in England itself. The universal trading traits of the sons of Albion, their looting politics, based on unfair business, and many other characteristic traits of the nation, which are not peculiar to any of the other European nations, that are even less cultured and civilized than the English. All these have long seemed very suspicious, and have drawn attention to a certain kinship between the Anglo-Saxons and the Jews. During the past two decades, in England and America, also on the European continent, particularly in France, a whole literature has been created, proving on the basis of many facts, suppositions and historical references, that the origin of the Anglo-Saxon race is not Germanic, but Semitic, that the English are the direct descendants of the Israelites, thrown by historic fate to the shores of the distant Albion. Indeed, the Lion of Judah, has become the British lion and adorns the coat of arms of the King of England. The harp of King David, to this day, represents the coat of arms of Ireland. But not only are the kings of England the direct descendants of Jewish kings, they are even seated on the throne of David, on which the ancient Jewish kings were married. This throne, on which Jacob fell asleep on that night when he jumped at the ladder, and when the Lord promised the kingdom to his posterity. This stone, called the Stone of Fate, which served for the weddings of Jewish kings, was brought to Ireland by the prophet Jeremiah. Turgis transferred it to Scotland, whence it was taken to London. It is curious to note that many prophecies about this fate of Israel fit England absolutely, as, for instance, the prophecy that Israel would become a great nation, a kingdom on islands, ruling over large colonies. North America is inhabited by the tribe of Manasseh, of whom it was said in ancient prophecy that he will become a separate great nation. The very word Saxon is derived from Isaacson, that is, the son of Israel. As one of the signs of kinship between the population of England and ancient Israel, we cannot help pointing out the close similarity between the English and Jewish tribes, the similarity in their manner of speech, and above all, trading as the fundamental characteristic of both nations. The particular reverence in which the English hold the Bible smacks of the Old Testament of the Jews. Even the preference on the part of the English for long clothes indicates something Asiatic. Arousing of late the unanimous indignation of the whole civilized world, the English at the same time call forward amazement at their traits, instincts, and aspirations, which positively make them a monster in the family of cultured and civilized European nations. As the proverb says, there is no family without a black sheep. Every monstrosity, however, is to be explained. Jews come from Jews. This interesting information is taken from Ludostansky's book. Nihilus and other writers of the Black Hundred camp pictured England in the same manner immediately after 1905. It was then the Russian governmental policy to discredit England and the Jews in the eyes of the Russian people and the Black Hundreds were employed by the Tsar as the medium through which to carry on this agitation. The Black Hundreds started their campaign in 1905, but their work was so venomous, so absurd, and so steeped in ignorance that there were few people even in Russia who paid any attention to it. That the Nihilist Protocols, which were published by the Black Hundreds, were not taken seriously in Russia, by the reactionaries, or even by the Black Hundreds, who sought every means of discrediting the Jews, 
may be gathered from the fact that in the most stupendous anti-Jewish plot ever devised by the Russian government to justify Jewish massacres, the notorious Bilus case, the protocols published eight years previously were never used by the prosecution, even though it resorted to every foul means that could be conjured up of slandering and vilifying the Jewish people. The very persons who were instrumental in spreading the protocols in Russia in 1905 seem to have realized that the false accusations which they contained were too transparent and too clumsy to deceive even the most credulous, and so they were discarded. But suddenly, after the armistice, a new edition of the Nihilist book containing the protocols, dated 1917, made its appearance as suitable to the chaotic conditions that prevailed in Russia and during the past two years. As has been shown, it was reproduced in various countries. This time, the anti-Semitic propagandists are trying to connect the protocols directly with Theodor Herzl and the Zionist movement. The war, the peace treaty, and Bolshevism are characterized as the fulfillment of these protocols, which they say had been devised no less than 929 years before the birth of Christ. By Solomon and other sages, the present protocols have been elaborated from the Redcliffe Gottschied versions by the Russian secret police department and the Black Hundreds who have scrapped all the evils in the world to the Jews. The Black Hundred writer G. Butme, whose book, Enemies of the Human Race, containing the fabricated speech by a famous rabbi, side by side with the protocols, gives several characteristic passages in his introduction that will convey to the reader a clear conception of the type of men who have stood behind the movement to discredit the Jews through the so-called protocols. On page 36 of this volume, Butme wrote, The French Revolution, which ended in the execution of Louis XVI in 1793, was engineered by England with the aid of the Jews and the Judaized Masons. Only the Jews profited by the French Revolution, even as they profited by the English Revolution, attaining in the general turmoil equal rights with the native population of France. Discussing the traits of the English people and finding a similarity between them and the Jews, Butme said on page 38, The British traits are well known all over the world. Their exceptional selfishness, their inhuman cruelty to foreigners, their inherent instinct of exploitation, their theoretical stupidity are mingled with practical shrewdness and utter brazenness. On page 39, he said, Meanwhile, the Britons have not distinguished themselves in anything. If we are not to take into consideration the fact that being thoroughly incapable of creating their own language, they have by their talent to distort languages given to the present English people a repulsive Judean Carthaginian imprint through their shameless self-satisfaction, arrogance, and treacherous inclinations. On page 41, he said, In 1843, the first lodge of the new Jewish Union, B'nai B'rith, was organized in New York. Gradually, this Jewish B'nai B'rith concentrates in its hands the direction of all Masonic lodges in America, and through them, it directs American politics. Translation of the Nihilist Protocol published in Russia in 1905. When we become rulers, we shall regard as undesirable the existence of any religion except our own, proclaiming one God with whom our fate is tied, as the chosen people, and by whom our fate has been made one, with the fate of the world. For this reason, we must destroy all other religions. If thereby should emerge contemporary atheists, then, as a transition step, this will not interfere with our aims. It will serve as an example to coming generations who will listen to the teachings of the Mosaic religion. By its sound and reasonable system, we have achieved the subjugation of all nations. We shall emphasize its mystic law, in which we shall say lies all power. On every occasion, we will publish articles in which we will compare 
a beneficent rule with the past. The benefits of peace, though achieved through centuries of turmoil, will stand out in relief in this era of blessings. The shortcomings of the Gentile administrations will be pictured by us in the darkest colors. We will sow such antipathy toward their governments that the masses will prefer peace in the condition of servitude to the rights of the so-called liberty which so tormented them and destroyed the very springs of human existence and which were exploited by a host of adventurers, not realizing what they were doing. The masses will become so satiated with the endless changes of administration, which we instigated among the Gentiles, when we were undermining their governmental institutions, that they will tolerate anything from us, rather than risk undergoing again such struggle and hardships. We will especially emphasize the historical mistakes of the Gentile administrations, which caused mankind to suffer for many centuries, through lack of real understanding in all that concerned its true welfare, pursuing fantastic projects of social welfare, and not noticing that these projects made worse instead of better the state of general relationships, which are the basis of human existences. The chief strength of our principles and measures will lie in that they are put forward and interpreted by us, as a sharp contrast to the old and decayed order of society. Our philosophers will discuss all the shortcomings of the Gentile religions, but no one will be allowed to discuss our religion from the true point of view except our own people. We shall have a fundamental knowledge of it, and will never dare to disclose its secrets. In countries that are called advanced, we have created a senseless, filthy, and disgusting literature. For a short time after our entrance into power, we shall encourage its existence so that it may show, in great relief, the contrast between it and the written and spoken announcements which will emanate from our exalted position. Our wise men, educated for leadership of the Gentiles, will prepare speeches, plans, notes, and articles through which we shall influence their minds, directing them along the lines of knowledge and understanding which we intend them to follow. Translation of the same protocol published by Butme in Russia in 1907, showing the changes made in the protocols within two years. When we become rulers, we shall at each suitable occasion compare our beneficent rule with the form of unsystematic administrations. The mistakes of the administrations of the Gentiles will be pictured by us in the most lurid colors. We will sow such antipathy and hatred towards these governments that the masses will prefer peace and quiet in a condition of servitude to the rights of the so-called liberty, which for many ages had so tormented them and destroyed the very springs of human existence and which were exploited by adventurers who did not realize what they were doing. The masses will become so satiated with the useless changes of administration, which we instigated when we were undermining their institutions, that they will accept anything that we may give them rather than risk undergoing again such struggle and disorder. Moreover, we will, through public criticism, especially emphasize the mistakes of the Gentile administrations, which caused mankind to suffer for many centuries through lack of real understanding in all that concerned its true welfare, pursuing fantastic projects of social welfare, and not noticing that these projects made worse, instead of better, the state of general relationships which are the basis of human existence. Our principles and faith will be especially useful, inasmuch as they will be put forward and interpreted by us, as a contrast to the old and decayed order of society. Our philosophers will discuss and criticize the shortcomings of the Gentile religions, but the latter will not be able to answer with regard to our faith, for no one is acquainted with its mysteries except our rabbis and town Buddhists, and they will never reveal it, for on them depends the power of guiding our flock. We have created a senseless, filthy, and disgusting literature, especially in the so-called advanced countries. For a short time after our entrance into power, we will not prohibit this literature, 
but will weed it out by means of destructive criticism, in order that, as a remnant of the Gentile ruins, there should be a stronger contrast between the literature that will come down from our height and that which emanated from the filthy mud of the Gentile governments. Thus, it is seen that Butme, publishing his version of the Protocols in 1907, two years after the Nihilist version had appeared, changed the text to suit his purposes. In 1905, before the first Russian Revolution, the Nihilist version of the Protocols said, We will show one of them our strength by means of violence, that is, by terrorism. After the Revolution, Butme changed the sentence to read, we have shown one of these governments our powers by assassination, by terrorism. And now the introducers of the protocols in this country and in Europe are pointing to Bolshevism as the fulfillment of the documents which have been concocted, elaborated, and changed by anti-Semites to serve the devious political purposes of their masters and their own. The protocols came into the world with the trademark made in Germany, and were elaborated under the auspices of the Russian Black Hundreds in their efforts to save the dying Russian autocracy. When the Russian autocracy was overthrown and members of the Black Hundreds were scattered in various lands, their financial and moral support shattered, they set out in quest of new sources of income. They are now resorting to their old discredited methods in a new environment, and thus the poison of the Russian Black Hundreds is being spread in England, Germany, France, the Scandinavian countries, Japan, and even in this country. The voice is the voice of dead despotic Russia, and the hand is the hand of the same Black Hundreds. And now, cowardly anonymous writers are embellishing the protocols, adding new lies to the old ones, making accusations against the Jews that even Douglas Lutostansky but me, did not to make in darkest Russia. Perhaps some day these new legends and absurd, malicious myths may evolve into a new and revised edition of secret Jewish protocols. In periods of turmoil and unrest, such venomous fabrications may gain prudence among the ignorant and may poison their minds. But, like all anti-Semitic myths of old, the newish anti-Jewish legends are bound to destroy themselves. A lie shuns the sunlight. It thrives in darkness. It cannot survive analysis. The truth will prevail. Israel has no secret protocols, no hidden designs. After all its tribulations, its dream is still of peace, of justice, and of human brotherhood. After all the centuries, the word that came from Sinai and the message of the prophets of old are still enshrined in its heart. Indeed, as has been aptly said, the holy scriptures are the only authentic protocols of the wise men of Zion. The End End of Chapter 6 End of the History of a Lie The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion by Herman Bernstein